Good morning, everybody. Thanks for gathering for worship and to hear from God's Word today. And I do hope that uh, you're finding perhaps some extended family, extended household, joining together with some others, at least at some point this day, this week, to, uh, to interact with some of the things we're going to be talking about. Whether you're viewing uh, these videos and doing the services together, or whether that maybe looks like meeting at another time to talk about some of the stuff uh, that we've been working through in these in these teaching videos, right? Um, th there is something really important and really necessary in uh, in working through some of this stuff together, right? We 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 can learn it individually, but we live it out together as God's people uh, with one another and in in interaction with our neighbors beyond uh, our church community as well. Today uh, we're looking at Daniel chapter four. Very interesting story. Now, I don't know, uh, maybe you have small kids at home. Um, maybe you've got some small grandkids around. Uh, maybe you, surely you've seen small kids or you were a small kid once. You know uh, that fights and squabbles happen pretty regularly. Somebody wouldn't share, somebody says something mean, someone purposely did a thing to, to a sibling that they, they know is particularly irritating. I'm sure we've all been through something uh, like the following scenario. So this is little little Timmy and, and little Billy and mom. So Timmy says something along the lines of, you're stupid, Billy. And then mom says, that's not a very nice thing to say, Timmy. Say you're sorry to Billy. And then Timmy says, I'm sorry you're so stupid, Billy. And then mom says, Timmy, say you're sorry and mean it this time. And then Timmy grudgingly, I'm sorry, Billy. We know there's such a thing as, as really saying you're sorry because you, you, know, you actually see that you've hurt someone, you feel remorse, and you don't want to do that thing again, and you, you are truly sorry. And then there's, there's fake saying you're sorry. You're not really sorry uh, for doing the thing. Uh, you're more sorry because either someone's making you apologize or you're, you're sorry that you got caught and are now facing consequences, right? And that's why people make fun of uh, us Canadians up around the world for overusing the word sorry, when we, maybe we just mean to say, you know, excuse me, or something along those lines. The word doesn't really mean much if you just use it all the time when you don't actually really mean it as a show of remorse, right? Now, if you've been paying attention so far uh, here in the book of Daniel, you might have noticed that on a number of occasions, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, seems to have a change of heart towards uh, the Hebrews that are captives in Babylon and toward their God. But the question is, is he actually saying these words because he means them and is having a genuine change of heart? Or is he just saying this stuff because uh, maybe it's politically expedient to do so in the moment or, or for some other reason? But let, let's just review this, right? Daniel chapter 1 uh, we don't get a real concrete thing here, but Daniel and his three friends, despite their strict diet of vegetables and water, are, the king proclaims, ten times better than all his homegrown magicians and enchanters. Then in Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel is able to interpret the king's dream, when all these uh, homegrown magicians and wizards can't do the, the task, Nebuchadnezzar proclaims, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And he promotes Daniel and his friends to important positions. So there's at least some uh, recognition of, of God's power and, and his ability voiced there. And then in Daniel 3, uh, when Daniel's friends won't bow down and worship the golden statue and they're thrown in the furnace, and then they're delivered from the flames by that mysterious fourth man, Nebuchadnezzar proclaims, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Again, pretty big words about the God of Israel, but is he saying them because he's actually having a genuine change of heart? Or uh, again, is, is he just kind of overcome with what's going on in the moment? 
Is he saying something that's kind of useful to say in kind of a difficult situation? Has he made any real progress? Well, let's look together at uh, Daniel chapter 4. Really, really interesting passage, and again, probably one you, uh, you learned at Sunday school at some point. Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretations. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven, let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down this tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. 
Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence, and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers, and his nails were like birds' claws. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom. And still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I think one of the first things we need to really notice in this story is the grace of God. You know, so frequently in these Old Testament stories, it could be easy to misconstrue this as, you know, angry and intolerant God of the Old Testament smites some guy for having a different religion. Well, that's not true. And this story goes a lot deeper than that. For starters, and we, I mean, we've seen this frequently, Nebuchadnezzar was kind of a, a conquering and cruel uh, tyrant on the level of any of the big names of more modern eras. And like most tyrants, I mean, he thought very little of punishing people cruelly uh, just on a whim. We see that again and again. He, he, he's, he's, what would you say? He, he can be very, uh, well, he flip-flops back and forth a lot, doesn't he? Uh, he's very volatile, I guess would be a good word for describing him. And I mean, he's a man who, who commits atrocities, enslaving entire populations and so forth. And yet, God still has grace for a guy like this. He waits patiently while Nebuchadnezzar seems to come ever so close to genuine repentance and real faith. As we've seen in the early chapters, he almost gets there time and time again but he never seems to quite get it. He doesn't quite make that full leap. And it's important to remember that this, this story that we're reading in Daniel chapter 4 seems to take place quite a long time after the events of the first three chapters. This seems to be well down the years into King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. There may have even been similar events as what was recorded in those earlier uh, three chapters that have happened that the book of Daniel doesn't even make any mention of. So it's worth noting, even before we get into the details, that even after he's had this, this warning dream and Daniel interprets it for him, he's still given a full year to get his act together and make things right, to humble himself and to turn from these sinful and cruel ways. I mean, the Lord is kind of giving him chance after chance after chance. Now, the first three verses here in our passage for today, uh, they seem to be sort of a, a frame narrative that, you know, they come at the end of the story, but he's using them kind of as a preface here. The king himself, in this case, unlike other places, is narrating his own experience. He's at ease in his palace, and then he has this dream. Unlike his previous dream in chapter 2, uh, this dream uh, disturbs him somewhat, and he sends for his wise men and sorcerers and so on to interpret it for him. 
and then they can't do it, so he sends for Daniel, or at least Daniel shows up. Not sure why he just dispensed, didn't dispense with all these other sorcerers and just consult with Daniel, given his previous track record, but there we have it. Furthermore, as we'll see right away, I'm not so sure it's that these other uh, interpreters can't interpret the dream. The, the interpretation seems fairly obvious. It seems that maybe they just don't want to interpret it, because for one, uh, the interpretation seems pretty ridiculous and hard to believe, and, and two, it's really bad news for the king. And we've already seen uh, the king doesn't like getting bad news or having people kind of cross him, you might say. So the contents of the dream are, are briefly these. There's a huge tree growing from the center of the earth, and it grew bigger and bigger until it reached the heavens, and it could be seen from anywhere on the whole earth. This tree produced abundant fruit, shade for animals from the hot sun, and, and homes for birds to live in. And then there's this watcher figure that descends from heaven and gives an order for the tree to be cut down and sawn up for lumber. However, the stump was to remain bound with this collar of iron and bronze. Then the stump, which up until now uh, has been kind of an it, becomes a man, a, a he, which introduces kind of an, an odd twist in the imagery. But I mean, that's, that's how dreams go, isn't it? They don't always have to make logical, rational sense. And this man is to have his right mind taken away from him and then be given the mind of a beast and live among them in the rain and eating grass like they do for, for seven seasons or times. Okay, so let, let's go through these and, and the, the interpretation thereof we'll get to directly. Now, the tree. I mean, this is one of the most basic imagery in, in all of ancient mythology. Interestingly enough, when it comes to uh, Babylonian mythology, we don't actually have a lot written about it, though we do see a lot of depictions of it frequently in their artwork. It probably indicates then that this was a, a deeply rooted uh, cultural mythological symbol. And this tree, it says, stands in the midst of, of the earth. That probably doesn't mean just kind of a generic, you know, central location, like saying Saskatoon is located in the, in the central part of Saskatchewan, or you know, Calgary or Edmonton is in the central part of Alberta, uh, something like that. You see, the ancients had this really strong understanding of this, this central, uh, sacred location where, where heaven met earth, where, you know, everything kind of crossed and lined up just right. And there's really strong understanding that, that this was kind of how the world was set up and that place mattered. And they often went to huge expenses and efforts to build gigantic monuments in the, these, these kind of sacred central uh, places, right? In Egypt, you had pyramids. In Mesopotamia, you had ziggurats. In ancient Britain, you had things like Stonehenge. And even here uh, in North America, uh, the ancient people built uh, medicine wheels and similar things, all, all kind of the similar idea anyhow, that these were, these were sacred and, and central places uh, where the spiritual realm, the divine realm, interacted with the natural or the human realm. Now this description here of this tree that's standing in, in this location where it's kind of mediating between heaven and earth, it sounds pretty great. It produces fruit that feeds all the living things, it shades the wild animals, it provides home for birds. But we should also see uh, some ominous aspects as well. I mean, where have we heard the phrase about its top reaching up to heaven before. Now, if you said the Tower of Babel, you win the prize. And this isn't the first time in Daniel that we've had this kind of a comparison either, right? You, you remember in uh, the first chapter, we read that the king took the plunder from the temple in Jerusalem and placed those, uh, those articles, those items of gold, in the temple of his God in the land of of Shinar, right, the ancient name for Babylon, which was used intentionally there to hearken back to the Tower of Babel and, and to point out that this is all part of a piece, this, this rebellion, that this will to power that exalts uh, the self and, and the human kingdom, uh, trying to push it up to the level of the divine, of God. So we got this tree, uh, then we have this watcher figure. This is clearly uh, some sort of heavenly being 
In fact, the term watcher is a description for angelic messengers. Turns out to be quite common in Jewish uh, post-exilic intertestamental literature. I mean, we might think of descriptions of heavenly beings in, in other places, like the book of Revelation, right? You have the, the, the heavenly creatures before the throne of God there depicted as having eyes uh, all over them. And furthermore, there's this kind of growing sense in Daniel and, and later post-exilic writings of angelic beings as you know, watching over certain areas of the world, kind of in some sort of protective fashion, you might say. Okay, so clearly, some sort of powerful heavenly being shows up with, with authority from God and says the tree is to be cut down and, and just the stump left. Obviously, the, the iron and bronze band must, must represent some sort of you know, protective measure, though we don't actually have any, any real evidence from uh, you know, the, the tree pruning culture of the day that this was a thing they did, but the, the explanation seems relatively clear there. And then, as I said, the imagery kind of goes sideways, or at least the message from, from the watcher does. The stump is a man who's going to change into a beast, or at least live as one of them in the open air, eating the grass, getting rained on for seven periods of time. Now, as I said, I don't think this dream probably should need a whole lot of, of great supernatural wisdom maybe to understand. Rather, I think it probably just took more courage to A, believe that this was actually a true thing that was going to come to pass, and B, actually speak such bad news to the king. You can see why Daniel uh, is dismayed here. But he gives the interpretation with as much tact as he can. And as I've mentioned in previous sermons, I, I just so appreciate this about Daniel, how, how he works in this system. He kind of plays along with it as much as he can. He speaks to the king uh, in a way that's, that's respectful, you might even say it, some people might say it could even border a little on flattering, but he doesn't, for all of that, hesitate to tell the truth, to speak the true interpretation to the king, even though it's bad news, even though it, it could get him into trouble. And, you know, it probably does show here that there's, there's at least some measure uh, of familiarity and maybe trust that's developed in, in this relationship by now. Because he, he takes it upon himself to give the king some advice, which is not something you would normally uh, presume to do uh, without at least being asked to do so. Basically, he tells the king that he should actually live up to the vision of what this tree was supposed to be, right? The, the, the tree was there to provide food and provide shelter and protection. And so he says, you know, be less of an oppressor and more of a provider. Practice justice and generosity and more care for your people. And if you do these things, it may be that you could avoid this fate and, and this, this judgment that's coming upon you. Now, we'll never actually know if he could have avoided that fate because he did not do these things. It seems like he, he did not, even though he had a full year uh, to do so, he, he didn't change his ways. He had a full year, you know, to stop, to stop paying lip service to God, to stop saying the right words outwardly, um, but not really making any any sort of change inwardly, right? To stop just saying good words about God and actually bow the knee in humility to him, and he didn't do so. So there he was, once again, taking his ease on the roof of his palace, looking at this wonderful city that he had built up, and he says, perhaps out loud, maybe just sort of in his heart, look at this beautiful city that I have built by my own power. And then flashback, you'll notice that this, this little section gets repeated numerous times in this passage, that voice from the dream comes back to him and announces once again the sentence, you'll be driven from among people and you'll be given the mind of an animal instead of the mind of a man. And immediately this comes true. Now, obviously modern people are gonna be like, whoa, 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 hold up. 
people are going to question whether this could really happen or some people are going to maybe uh, get kind of off on a side tangent trying to diagnose uh, the king's condition as some specific type of uh, what they would have once called madness or we would probably now call mental illness. Now let's just remember, it doesn't say that he actually turned into a cow or a donkey. It just says that he kind of lost his mind and he lived like, he lived among the animals. And that's not exactly beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, furthermore, while some people are going to point out that there's nothing in the secular sources about it, th the truth is there's really very little in any of the secular sources about anything from the latter portion of King Nebuchadnezzar's life. They talk about the early part of his reign when he was conquering and building up this big empire. doesn't say a whole lot anywhere in the, those sorts of, of Babylonian chronicles about what happened later in his life. And you know, here's the thing. Ancient chroniclers were not real big on uh, reporting embarrassing things about their rulers. Remember that whole thing about being torn limb from limb? Yeah, that, they had good reason to sort of only portray their kings and queens and emperors in the most positive of, of lights possible. Now, maybe over-familiarity with this story from Sunday schools kind of kind of dulled us a little bit to it, but it's a pretty crazy story. I mean, what if one day the prime minister of our country just disappeared? And I was going to say disappeared from parliament. Parliament's on pause sort of right now. But I mean, what if, what if he just disappeared one day and then nobody knew where he was and then seven years later they found him in a local dairy barn living with the cows? Like, that's crazy. Now, clearly in an ancient world, without you know mass media and electronic rapid communications, they, they could have concealed this somewhat more than, than we could now. But I mean, still, people would have started to wonder where the king was. I mean, even common people it wouldn't have seen the king very frequently. I mean, they would have wondered why he wasn't making any appearances anymore, why he wasn't showing up at the big festivals and, and such things. Now, it's hard to know exactly what remained of his mental faculties uh, throughout this time and, and coming to the end of it. But at the end of this time, it says that he raised his eyes to heaven and he praised the true God and, and he was restored. And he says here, uh, for his kingdom, or for, sorry, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now that's certainly saying a lot more than he ever said previously. You know, and it, 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 for many reasons here, you could say it genuinely seems like he, he's learned his lesson. He has expressed genuine humility this time. But you know, we don't get... Uh, from, from the narrator, from, from Daniel, I suppose, any sort of real, uh, real evaluation there, right? There's no little aside comment that says, you know, in all of this, Nebuchadnezzar truly repented and put his trust in the Lord and, and, you know, any of, and the Lord was pleased with him, anything like that. There's good pointers that this may possibly have been the case, at least in the framework he had, but it, it's, in the end, it's left a little bit ambiguous. So what do we do with all this? Well, I, I would propose a couple of things, two things. First, we should examine ourselves. I think it can be all too easy to look at this story of someone like Nebuchadnezzar and go, you know, he it was a cruel tyrant, just lump Nebuchadnezzar in with, with Hitler and Stalin and Henry VIII and all the characters from history that did cruel things. And, and then we can just say, well, I'm not like any of those wicked people over there. I mean, on one level, that's true. None of us are, are wicked tyrants who would kill people on a whim. At least we've never had opportunity to do so. So we're, we're pretty sure we're not. You know, I remember a few years back now when, uh, when Tiger Woods had his, his fall from grace and kind of fell off the, the golf map. 
And there were a lot of people at that time saying things like, how could he do a thing like this? Guy's married, got the world before him. He's married to a beautiful supermodel, carrying on like this with, with all these other women. And I just remember thinking, you know, don't, don't be so sure of what you would or wouldn't do in a situation like that, right? Good looking man, sports celebrity, super successful, heaps of money, traveling all the time to these tournaments in exotic locations all around the world. Opportunity, opportunity's always there. Don't be so sure of, of what you would or would not do given the chance, right? Why do I bring that up? Well, you know, we might not be guilty of the worst kinds of sins and on the biggest scales, but that might not be because we're just so holy that we are immune to sin. You know, we might, despite being believers, still have some kind of dark and self-absorbed little corners of our hearts, and those can just find expression in, in some less overt ways, but they're still there. You know, here's another thing on this topic. In a season like this, uh, when, when things seem chaotic, you know, uh, when you, you turn on the news and you're never quite sure what crazy thing you're going to be reading about today, what new doom is going to turn up for humanity this time. It, it can be easy, I think, to start slipping into a, a kind of victim mindset. Now, that's not to say that hard things that are going on in the world are not real. And that's not to say that on top of all of that, some of you are, are I know, facing genuine hardships unique to your own uh, family situations, health situations, and so on. But there is still a way in which a sort of victim mindset can, can set in where everything is just happening out there and it's being done to me. And there's a way in which, well, there's a way in which that can become kind of its own form of, of self-absorption. It's not the, the same exactly as this kind of pride that we read about, but it's still a form of, of just kind of, uh, yeah, unremitting focus on self. And so I would encourage you, take some time today, do that heart check. You know, maybe you're not making these kind of grandiose boasts like King Nebuchadnezzar was. Probably you're not. But are there any other ways that self-absorption has, has started to creep in here and there? Are there ways and or things that, you know, you know that old definition of sin, right? Uh, where you're curved in on yourself. Take some time today and make that right. Lift your eyes to heaven and get a proper perspective, right? Put, put all that, put yourself in the proper place and realize that God is in the ultimate place. Lift your eyes to heaven. Nebuchadnezzar's restoration ends in kind of an ambiguous fashion, but you know, ours doesn't have to. God's word tells us that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive them and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Second, as you do that, take heart. You know, yes, there are, there are corrupt and, and wicked powers at work in the world, powers and principalities, if you want to call them that, sickness and sin, pain and death. But I just want to leave you with one thing that I, I, think is, I think is hinted at in this passage in just a beautiful fashion. We have this image of a tree which is huge and, and, and reaches up to heaven, where the birds of the air find shelter, but which is ultimately chopped down and brought low. But in his parables, um, our Lord Jesus, who, who didn't reach this way up to heaven, but who came down from heaven in humility, he tells a parable of, of a tiny mustard seed, which grows to become a mighty tree in which the birds of the air find shelter. And he says that this is a picture of the kingdom of God. 
See, the kingdoms of the world, even when they are powerful, seemingly all-powerful, super-powerful, untouchable, they're eventually cut down to size, no matter how improbable or even how impossible it seems that that could ever happen. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, though it seems to begin from just the, the smallest, tiniest, humblest of beginnings, and, and seems to always be beset and up against all odds and all opposition, it grows with unstoppable growth and it lasts forever. And interestingly enough, in this passage today, we have an, an affirmation of that that came from the lips of a pagan king, that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You know, friends, somehow, sometimes in our world and even sadly in our Christian culture, we can think that, that you know, confessing our sins is somehow, I don't know, distasteful or even unhealthy somehow. You know, here's what you're doing. When, when you do find, find something wrong and, and you actually get that out in the open, maybe before some other trusted people, maybe before the Lord, when you actually deal with those things, you know what you're doing? You know, when you're humbling yourself before God in that way, you're, you're placing your faith and your trust and your hope in that kingdom, which will last forever. And that is a beautiful thing. So look up. Look up to find God's mercy when and, and where and, and how you need it. And, and in doing that, look up to see his kingdom for what it is, ultimate and, and everlasting and all-powerful. And when you see that, I think the only proper response is to give him praise and glory. Amen.